index card. The purpose of these cards, if you would like to ask our candidates any questions this evening, this is for all of our candidates. Please feel free to write your questions down, raise your card in the air, and we'll have one of our board members come around from PTA hmm? and pick up your cards. Oh, I can't. You're in my way. We can go ahead and read the rules that we're going to be going by tonight for the candidates. Each candidate will be able to have a two-minute statement for our opening. The bell will ring once after a minute and 30 seconds, and then again two times at the two-minute mark. When the bell rings two times, the candidate is asked to please end your response. When being asked questions, you'll be told a time limit for each question if it is other than two minutes. Some questions may be a two-part question and you can be given up to three minutes, and other questions could be a one-minute question. So again, when you have 30 seconds remaining, the bell will ring once. If your time is up, the bell will ring twice. In closing, each candidate will be given two minutes for a clothing statement. A bell will ring once at the one minute and 30 second mark, and again twice at the two minute mark. When the bell rings, please end your response. I'd like to thank Devin with WFPL this evening. He's going to be our moderator asking the questions. Thank you so much. Because we have five of you and the other panels were two each, um, I might shorten the length of time that you have to answer some of the questions just to get through some of them. Um, Lee, if we can, Mr. Bailey, uh, start with you with opening statements, two minutes. Um, she'll ring the bell at minute 30. Please begin. Thank you. My name is Lee Bailey, and the reason I'm running for school board is nothing new. I think everybody at this table will probably agree that we feel that JCPS is not delivering on their promise. Our students, our children are not getting the education they deserve. I grew up in a family of professional educators. I have a father that was a professor at UK. My mother taught elementary school for 60 years. I've been around teachers my whole life. I'm afraid we're not doing the job. I also am a high school sports official. Now that has nothing to do with the school system except I'm used to making decisions that necessarily don't make people happy. We always joke that if you make all the calls right, half the people in the gym are going to hate you. Well, I don't have a problem with that. I believe that the school board should make decisions not based on who supports them or doesn't support them, who endorses them or doesn't endorse them, what friendships you have or don't have. We need to make those decisions based on the facts and the understanding that the school system is there to educate our children. Period. If we don't meet that goal, we've failed. That's why I want to be on the board. I want to be that person who will make that decision based on the facts. And I'm not scared to make people angry by doing the right thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Horn. Nothing is more important than our children. You know this. It's why you're here. It's why, for the last 15 years, I've volunteered directly in our schools. As PTA president of Ballard, as the site-based decision-making board member at Cameron Middle School, and as a weekly volunteer at Bowen Elementary. I'm running for school board to tackle the extraordinary challenges that we face. Together, we can make our schools great. The latest audit, it was a great tool, but our children are more than just numbers. With me, you know what you're going to get. Genuine and trusted leadership by listening, solving problems, and connecting to solutions. I'm thankful for the broad support and endorsements that I have received. I have three top priorities. One, raising achievement. I'll be child-focused in all my decisions. Number two, stronger financial stewardship. The budget, it's $1.4 billion. As a business owner and attorney, I have the right experience to oversee this budget. We need more funds in the classroom now. We need to commit to first-class schools, no excuses, a full-core press. Thank you very much. Ms. Morin. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Angie Morin, and I grew up in District 3. I graduated from Ballard High School. 
My husband graduated from Ballard High School and we had two children that we sent to public schools also. Um, I went on and graduated from the University of Kentucky with an accounting major, became an auditor. I was hired by Abel Construction Company, which is one of the largest construction companies here in the city, to be their controller. I went on to become the Chief Financial Officer for Blue Bin Seafood, and I did that job for over 20 years. Um, a couple of years ago, when I was taking my oldest uh, away to college, I made a decision but, but that by the time I was going to take my youngest away to college, which happened a couple months ago, I'm now officially empty nester, uh, I made a decision that I was ready to leave the kind profession and try to find a way that I could start giving back to the community and use my skill set to do that. So this summer when the auditor's report came out, it was uh, upsetting to read some of his conclusions. Uh, a couple of them in particular, one concerning the fact that uh, in his opinion, uh, the current school board members lack the depth of understanding to actively examine and question the budget. Uh, he also said that the current um, JCPS uh, central office was a bloated bureaucracy that uh, it was intent on serving itself and keeping the board in the dark. Um, that along with a lot of the other of the 45 findings really got my attention and uh, got me to thinking about um, stepping forward. I know it got a lot of people's attention in the community. Uh, the editorial started, the uh, full page ad started asking for citizens with financial background to step up and be willing to do this work and that's exactly when I got involved and decided to step up and get involved. Thank you so much. Mr. Scarpellini. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be here today. Thank the PTA. I think if you read educational literature, the history of American education, I think the PTA is often gets a short shift. A, a very, very important um, element of today's education. Um, been involved in education my entire life. Um, you know, I'm a, um, bachelor's degree in social studies, uh, economics, and master's in uh, political science and doctorate in public administration. Have the background, um, was a program manager for the federal government, retired from that, and was involved in a lot of uh, audits, things like that. And you would turn me on to audits, I forgot prior to I used to look a lot of them, which makes a good point, she really does. I'm, Cabbage here from a footnote, but it makes sense for the board to spend more time on the audit issues. Um, also, um, believe in education, the role of education and democracy. I think that's sometimes overlooked. You know, you look at the literature, you know, maybe 50 years ago, they talked about education being a leveling agent, where it helped create a middle class. We need to get more toward doing that. Um, the idea of equity in education. Um, as you do nothing for those in need, for those that have, until you've done something for the, those in need. You know, that's basically Western philosophy. And I see that sort of the school system. Uh, the audit says, you know, we are somewhat, um, you know, administrative, he administratively heavy. Perhaps a, a, something like putting audit, uh, you know, administrators in the classroom one day a week. Uh, so they know what it's like to teach. I mean, they did it at college level. Deans required to teach one class, uh, advise students. I think we need innovation, but controlled in innovation. Um, looking at what the statistics say, uh, keeping in mind that it's really the kids that are important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Schultz, two minutes. Thank you. JCPS has a $1.4 billion budget, more than double the budget of the Metro Louisville. Why are our student achievement levels so low? Our community cannot afford to lose another generation of students to low performing or failing schools. The budget is just the tip of the iceberg. My business degree and 40 years of experience managing a successful real estate firm qualifies me to address the financial problems and budget issues. As a board member, it is my fiduciary duty to the taxpayers to ensure that monies from the bloated bureaucracy are spent wisely and funneled to the classroom. In addressing the scathing audit, I propose an immediate outside audit of the financial department and its total reorganization. The greatest problem in our school system is the failure to successfully educate our students. I will work to preserve the outstanding magnet programs. If parents don't choose those magnet programs, my number one priority is to 
engage parents with schools close to their homes. We need to address the educational, social, and economic issues that plague families by providing a rapid response team at every school to immediately address student issues. As a real estate broker, I help families transition into Louisville. I have spent many years working with and studying JCPS as a community leader, businesswoman, realtor, parent, and grandparent. I feel I am the best qualified to lead the changes necessary to rebuild the school system. Please get out and vote and help me turn this bloated bureaucracy into the best school system in the nation. Thank you so much. Um, I will be trying to go in order in my own mind of who is going to be answering the question next. So it'll go uh, Ms. Horn next and then more of you will start once we will go into the new round. Um, so uh, Ms. Horn, this is for you. A, uh, a two minute question, up to two minutes. The audit report addresses the amount of funding JCPS spends in the district offices, recommends less be spent in central administration, more be spent in schools. Would you cut anything in JCPS's uh, <coughs> district offices to free up resources for funds uh, in the schools and what would you cut? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I know that there had been an audit maybe three years ago and it showed that the salaries of the central office administration, um, may everybody you know, making over 100,000 was a very, very high number of people. And uh, that really didn't change in the three years. Uh, significantly, we were, we were still two or three times larger than our peer districts. So um, I still think that there are um, some salaries there um, that in the central office that definitely the funds um, you know, need to be going into the classroom. So there should be, and I know the audit called for, a comprehensive salary study. And I think that is a very, very good idea um, to do that. Um, there also, you know, um, the, sp the question specifically goes to cuts in um, district offices. What I could do with those funds, I think, um, if you're looking at somewhere between, you know, they say that the administration said 67% was going toward instruction, but the audit said 53%. So that is quite a difference that's a, of $1.4 billion. So um, I, with that money, I mean, I would definitely like to see it um, make its way into the classroom to, you know, we could fund textbooks. Um, I know a lot of our classrooms are not wireless. Um, there are some schools that are totally wireless. Um, but, you know, a lot of schools, we're just still trying to get um, individual classrooms to be wireless. So I think connecting, um, connecting the students to um, the outside um, world, whether it's via, you know, an online textbook, you know, would definitely improve instruction um, and taking that from central office and putting it in the classrooms would just go a long way. Thank you so much. Up to two minutes, uh, Ms. Morin. Uh, what would you cut in JCPS's district offices, if anything, to free up resources and funds for schools? Okay, well, the good news is we have a plan for that, and I think it needs to be noted that uh, Dr. Harkins called for this audit and this board called for this audit. Uh, this plan that the auditor came out with has 45 findings and 219 recommendations. There's a lot of work right there that we can go ahead and get started on immediately. Now, I know that some things have been done. I don't think enough has been done to this point, and I don't think the sense of urgency is there. But um, we have warehousing issues. We have personal use of JCPS vehicles. We have cell phone issues. Um, one of kind of my pet peeve being uh, an auditor, a CPA, and a CFO is uh, if the findings number 25 through 27 directly speak to the need of restructuring the inter internal audit department, uh, which is different than the accounting department. But that internal audit department is a very useful tool or could be and is not being utilized at this point. Uh, the auditor has called for the board to make sure that that, that department be retasked. We have about a half a million dollars of salary in that <coughs> department that should be tasked uh, as the board sees fit. Right now that department head is not there. We're looking, I know they're looking for one, but again, that needs to happen a little quicker in my view. And that director at this point uh, reports directly to the superintendent. That really is not best accounting standards or principles or, or common uh, procedure. That person, he or she needs to be reporting to the board 
uh, that allows a better oversight and a freer opinion if you're, if you're um, not telling your boss whatever, whatever everything that's going wrong, that's the person who's giving you your raise or whatever. So that needs to change also. So there's a pretty good roadmap to start with. So I don't think I'd have to come up with anything right off the bat. Thank you so much. Mr. Scarpellini, uh, what would you do with the JCPS Central Office, if anything? Um, that, um, that's a good question. First, they implement the audit. That's sort of like, you know, these are simple things first. And we'll aggressively implement um, the findings. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, need some more cough drops here. Uh, but, uh, thank you. Uh, also, um, begin to look at the audit as a learning tool. I sort of learned that from the federal government. We got audits and grantees, and my branch looked at them. You know, they can have positive impacts. They can reverberate through an organization in a positive way. Uh, begin to look at uh, the audit as a way to cut down on empire building. I think it's a rule, you know, basically going back to paper, the idea of uh, what is a bureaucracy? They tend to be self-serving. They tend to be empire building. You know. And keep it simple. Make it the system work for the kids, so to speak. Um, look at travel. I think that's always an issue uh, in audits. Look at procurement, things like that. How many cars do you really need? Um, the basics. And also, I think, uh, begin to maybe look at putting some ministers back in the classroom. Um, you know, it's the idea that. Um, you know, you can't have a broad bureaucracy in a good school system or any other thing. It just doesn't work well. Um, fire departments uh, tend not to be bureaucratic. But they're very effective. Right now, um, in Middletown, there's one battalion chief and uh, commanding the entire system. You wouldn't see that here. I mean, there are probably, I don't know how many chiefs you have here, but the idea can be lean and mean and still do the job. Thank you so much. Ms. Schultz, uh, same question. Well, the first thing, I totally agree that JCPS administration is very top-heavy. I had a private meeting with Adam Edlin. I also talked to Gene Wilhoy. Gene Wilhoy is the uh, administrator that decided who the benchmark schools were going to be. We had a long discussion about that. The reason he picked those schools was because he said everything in the data the JCPS writes, talks about how we want to be the best urban school in the nation. So he took the benchmark schools that he felt were going to be the best. We need to be watching those benchmark schools. We need to analyze them. We need to understand where their money is spent. We have 369 administrators making over $100,000 a year. This is way beyond any benchmark school that we had um, in the state audit. That's very, very <clears throat> inexcusable in my opinion. I also think that we need to have an external audit for just those 369 positions and look at those recommendations and take those recommendations and either alleviate, eliminate some of those positions or whatever. The 369 positions is way over what the government in Frankfurt has. The other thing, as Angie said, there were 45 findings in the audit. We can take care of everything that Adam Evelyn said. The distribution system is a dinosaur. We have the most qualified logistic companies in the world here. Surely to goodness, they can come up with a great logistic distribution system and we don't need to use a warehousing dinosaur method. We can save millions and millions of dollars. Thank you so much, Mr. Bailey. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it very simple. I'm not gonna disagree with the rest of this group. I think we need to take the audit findings and put them as a first priority. But 1A to that should be a comprehensive review of job descriptions for those people at the top of the administrative ladder. I think we'll find that a lot of those people have do-nothing jobs, but they make a nice income. I think we can combine a number of those positions, cut those salaries, and put that money to better use. It's, it's a tough decision, but we need to have people make tough decisions. We are 
gambling with the lives of our children. They will not be prepared for the real world if we stay on the course we're on. We need to keep the money we've got, reapply it in the correct ways toward classroom instruction, make sure our children are ready when they graduate. Simple as that. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Morin. One minute to answer this question uh, about taxes. Do you support raising taxes to pay for public education? Uh, the latest decision not to raise taxes, but previous decisions as well. Um, I, I was very happy that they decided not to raise taxes. Uh, we're spending over $13,000 per student right now. Uh, if you look to other urban districts uh, that are actually having higher success than us, they're getting it done uh, for that amount or a little bit less. So I think it's not really spending more right now, it's spending more effectively right now. So uh, yes, I, I, I mean, I would not, I don't think we need any more money right now. I think we need to use what we have more effectively. Mr. Scarbellini, same question. Well, thank you. Um, it's the idea that um, you know taxes can't be continually raised. We take money out of, this, out of the system, it impacts it in different ways. Um, and look, the more I get into this, the more I see I don't think there is a reason to raise taxes. Um, I think there's efficiencies of scale involved in any organization. Uh, you, you can begin to um, you know, understand that um, other countries educate students a lot, you know, for half of what we do. Um, the idea that somehow we have to have some cost built into this and understand what our goals were and somehow effectively meet those goals financially. Thank you so much, Ms. Schultz. I totally agree that the property taxes should not be increased this year. I would act on the budget findings of Adam Eaglin in order to streamline the budget and funnel monies into the classroom. I would propose an executive search for a world for a world class CFO from the business sector. And I would ask for a complete reorganization of the financial department here at JCPS. Until we are able to properly identify the expenses and analyze their effectiveness, we should not be demanding more from the taxpayers. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Throwing money at a problem never solves it. And that's what they're asking us to do. Raise taxes so we can throw money at the problem, but the problem's not going to disappear. The problem, as identified in the audit, has existed for years. There's sufficient funding already in place if it is properly used. What we need to do is implement the audit, make the necessary cuts, move the money from administrative levels into the classroom. We don't need to raise taxes. They haven't shown a need for it. They've just said we need more money, but they've never given us a good reason why we need more money. Prove it. Then we'll vote for it. But until they prove it, no, no raise. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Yes. On the latest decision to not raise taxes, I supported that. Um, with the findings and the audit, um, it was uh, just, we have enough. And that was the sentiment um, of people in our district I listened to. Um, I, I went and talked to people in smaller cities. I wa have walked the district. And uh, I also talked to our some of our administrators at in the schools, the principals, and and looked at it, um, but I do think that through the audit, it pointed out there was you know some better budgeting um, that the board would be able to review um, monthly you know income expense um, statements showing actuals, comparing you know actuals, and uh, and the variances. And I think um, that is a needed change and could really um, amplify you know the areas that you know we see um, that we could capture money um, instead of raising taxes. So at this time, no. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Scarpellini, um, do you support charter schools? And one minute for this question for the, for the whole group. Uh, do you support charter school legislation and charter schools? I uh, do not support charter schools. Charter schools are best uh, financed um, privately. Uh, funds are too scarce for uh, public schools. It's, uh, the problem has to be solved in the public education realm, to be honest. 
It may take sacrifices, it may take changes, you know, it may not be a great experience. But I honestly believe that charter schools um, have a place um, in the educational system that is not the end to, um, you know, public funds or public involvement. Charter schools are best handled by themselves. Thank you. Ms. Schultz. My first priority to our students at JCPS is to raise the academic achievement levels. That is all this is about. If charter school data suggests that student achievement levels are and students excel using that business model, we need to seriously research and discuss the possibility of that alternative method. I don't think any item is off the table if our primary goal is to achieve academic excellence for every student. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. I support charter schools. I think the children in charter schools are more involved. They feel that they belong. They are part of the system. Their parents are involved. Parental involvement, student involvement increases their productivity. If that's what it takes, <coughs> we should do it. The bottom line here is educate our children. And if charter schools are the way to do it in certain neighborhoods, I would support it 100%. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Right now, there is no um, charter school law in Kentucky. So it really is a state legislative issue. Um, if it were to be passed by the state legislature, I would vigorously advocate for local control. Um, I think we need local control of our schools. Um, this, the Board of Education should be in control of whether a, a school would be allowed a charter or not. But I am for good schools. Um, I'm for good schools, they just it cannot hurt public education in the bargain. Thank you. Ms. Morton. Yeah, there's 42 other states that are currently using charter schools. Again, uh, it's, it's not going to be this board or a board that decides that it will be at the state level. Uh, but I, I would like to add that I agree that I don't think anything should be off the table. If uh, we can learn from the other 42 states, if we see what's working or something is uh, really having some great success for some children, then that needs to be on the table. We need to be looking at that. Some of the biggest and strongest arguments against charter schools usually have to do with the adults in the room and not about the children. And we need to stay focused on the children and making sure we're putting them on a path for their success. So I would say keep it on the table. Thank you. And Ms. Schultz, this uh, question goes to you. It's from the audience. Uh, two minutes to answer this question. In recent legislation, Kentucky has raised the age that students are required to stay in school to 18. What would you recommend for programs and or resources to retain and engage these students? Well, first of all, that's the problem we have. We need to engage parents in the child's education. It always works a lot better if you start at preschool and you go to kindergarten. But when you have children that you have raised the level to stay in high school. It is so important you get the parents engaged in this. They can be, um, they can have remediation at those schools if they're having problems and have on-site people that are doing it. They can deal with the social and the economic problems of the family because if you don't stabilize the family, obviously the child is going to be lacking. Thank you so much, Mr. Bailey. Up to two minutes. I think it's important that, just like Ms. Schultz said, to get the family involved. I go back to an earlier statement. I am a big advocate of neighborhood schools because it allows the parents to be involved. It allows the students and their parents to be involved together. Almost 50% of the students in JCPS live below the poverty line. When you move a child cross county to school, they miss out on a lot of the education that is available to them. No after school activities. Mom and dad can't come to a parent teacher's conference because they don't have the financial wherewithal to get cross county to meet that teacher. involvement by the student and the parent is critical. Keeping them till they're 18 is, is a good start, but if they're not involved, they're just treading water. They're not making any headway. 
get back to where we can have that involvement between the parents, the teachers, the administrators, and the students as a team. Neighborhood schools is the answer to part of that issue. And that's why I support it strongly. Thank you so much, Ms. Horn. Two minutes. What would you recommend for programs and resources retain and engage students who might otherwise drop out when the uh, dropout age rises? Yes. I think it's really exciting that our children, um, you know, we do have a requirement that they stay in school longer because one of the most important aspects is that classroom time. It's that time with the teacher in the classroom. So anything we can do to have more of that, obviously our children will be more prepared for career and for life. And that's the goal of that our, you know, through education, we can transform our community. So I really think the longer they're there in school and um, the more opportunity that we have to reach them. And I think that the, um, the things that, that, that are going on currently with these career academies in the different high schools and the real big focus on the ACT preparation is just exciting because I think that the children, um, they can stay in longer and then they have a better, you know, a better uh, path to, to be more successful if they are going to college or if they're going into a technical training. So I just think it, it just, it's really exciting that um, we, we do have that law that you know, puts them, keeps them in school longer. Thank you so much. Ms. Morton, same question. Yes, I think it's, it's great, but it definitely does present a challenge for the district. Um, I think that it's gonna be, uh, we're gonna need to maybe pull in more of our corporate uh, partners into this. Uh, I know Ford, is, and we've got great corporate partners, but uh, the externships, the career um, ac uh, academies, the, the aerodynamic magnets, the communication magnets, uh, start giving these high school age juniors and seniors some things that are a little more exciting and real world so that they can start seeing maybe that vision or that path that they'll go next. I mean, they have to be there, so if we can just find something that can excite them um, at a different level or in a different way. And, and we do need to be innovative with that, but I think reaching out to the community and our corporate uh, partners will be critical in this step. Thank you so much, Mr. Scarpellini. Oh, thank you. Uh, would you um, recommend? Education literature shows involvement improves intent, you know, uh, attendance, uh, ability to stay in school. Um, the board has currently a Saturday school program. Look at expanding that. Um, return to vocational education. I was in high school in the um, mid-60s, early 60s, whatever. Um, there was a large vocational program, large, uh, you know, welding shop, you know, wood shop, uh, you know, blades, things like that. We're, we're expanding, the United States nationally expanding its industrial base. Make jobs for these kids, long the work half a day kind of thing. Um, again, innovation, use the ROTC program as a base to discipline students or help with the discipline to keep them in school. Uh, Indiana, for example, you can earn your two-year degree while you're still in high school. Um, maybe more of that. Um, also, um, when I was chairman of the fire science program at Sent University, uh, we solved our basically attendance problem with making it very practical. We put on a recruit class. So you came to VU, you went through a recruit class, you came out a certified firefighter. Uh, you got your hazmat certs. Uh, you know, became an EMT. A lot of kids uh, worked their way through the second year with the EMT cert they earned uh, the first year. Thank you so much, Mr. Bailey. This question goes to you. Um, up to one minute for this question. The gap issue shows great disparity between different groups, especially students with disabilities. How do we address this and close the gaps between all student groups? I think the answer there is, and I hate coming back to the same thing, is an involvement issue. We need to have teachers, and administrators who can help identify the issues and direct the students to the right teachers, to the right programs. Uh, we need to be more involved one-on-one -on -one with the students in, in, in figuring that, that out. 
I don't have a real solid answer for that. It's, uh, it's kind of like the question, how long is a piece of string? I'm not real sure, uh, but it's something we would have to look at. Ms. Warren. Um, I was today in a couple schools, and I talked to uh, the principals to find out, and I asked them directly, you know, what, what can we do to um, bridge this gap? And one of the things that both of them said was the professional learning communities that have been created in the schools, um, they are making a difference. Um, what they are doing is getting down, drilling down, they said, to the kid level. And so the, the teachers are meeting like sometimes once a week to, to find out what's going on in the life of that child that's getting in the way of that instruction. And uh, it's, it's very, very good because that's what we need. We need to, to reach every child. And I think we're starting to do that. Thank you. Ms. Morin, how do we address the gap issue? So the gap issue, um, you know, it's been around, we've been talking about this for 30 or 40 years. And <clears throat> the gap actually begins when kids are three and four years old. You can already see the gap. It's pre get, even getting into kindergarten. So I know there's a lot of attention right now about um, the preschool, and I know the JCPS, that is definitely on the radar, and there's, you know, we're, we're heading in that direction. So I think that's very important. And then I, I need to echo also uh, these, uh, these professional learning communities, and you need, a high quality teacher is the most powerful tool that you can have. So to get these teachers working together in communities, um, I, I think is, we are getting some success from that, and I think the, the, the needles are moving in the right direction because of these PLCs. I agree. Thank you so much. Mr. Scarpellini. Um, definitely. Closing the, the gap is a major issue. And it's a major challenge, too. Um, you know, keep one way would be to look at best practices of other school systems, you know, large systems like Los Angeles, Cleveland, something like that. Also, uh, go, the, look at the effectiveness of the individual learning plans that you require you know, in uh, Kentucky. Are they being implemented? Are there resources there to implement? That's key. I think it also works back somewhat to neighborhood schools where parents can come in and be involved. Also, some districts have hired parents of uh, challenged students and brought them into the classroom and it's been a workable solution. Thank you. Ms. Schultz. Well, research from the Harvard Family Research Project from the Harvard Graduate School of Education shows that family involvement helps children get ready to enter school, promotes elementary school children's success, prepares you for college, and supports all children, especially those less likely to succeed in school. So engaging parents and students in schools close to their houses makes for an easier transition. In addition, as I've said two or three times already, rapid response teams in every school addressing social, education, and economic issues that ultimately result in higher student achievement is imperative at JCPS. Thank you, and uh, we are down to our last question, um, unfortunately, and then we have to go to final statements. Uh, this went by a lot quicker than I thought. Um, so for that, I guess uh, Ms. Horn will start with you. Uh, where do you see, the, and two minutes for this, where do you see the greatest hope for the future of public school education in Louisville? I see the greatest hope in the fact that we are starting to embrace early childhood education. Because if we can catch the child as a you know, three, four, five-year-old, the earlier we can capture them, it's just going to make a difference. They will then have more time with the teacher. They will, they're learning, um, I guess I'll just say, will multiply exponentially. My mother was an early childhood educator. She had her master's in early childhood. She taught um, in Illinois, and she is here now in Louisville. And um, she knew the value of early childhood. So for me, that's what I see. Uh, I do think, though, that it does need to become a part of our mission. Um, right now, as a district, we are funding it, making up the gap that the federal and the state government is, is not funding. 
But if we are going to really dedicate ourselves to early childhood, we need to make it a part of our mission plan and our, and our goals and become more accountable um, in that area. But I see on the back end, um, we will save money in the long run, less re you know, remediation. Um, and uh, you know, when the kids get to high school, they'll just be better prepared right from the start. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Where do you see the greatest hope for the future of public school education, public education in Louisville? In Louisville, I would say always the greatest hope is having an effective teacher in every classroom. That needs to be the goal. Um, and this district is working on that uh, through these professional learning communities and through the PEGES, the Professional Growth and Evaluation Effectiveness System, and then uh, our principals also are going to uh, uh, to the NISL, and that's the National, um, I'm going to get this wrong, National Institute for School Leadership. If you, if you listen to uh, other districts in the nation, so let's, let's take uh, Metro Atlanta, because I think they were just named one of the top urban school districts in the nation, which is our goal, that's what we're heading for. Uh, that superintendent says there's literally two positions that, that create the magic, and that's the teacher and the principal. And it's that leadership and then, then working together in these peer groups that where the magic is going to come because people uh, perform and, and uh, their actions meet to their peer groups, the expectations of their peer groups. That's what we need to be looking towards. So if you have the teachers all working together and they can uh, see the students that are having the problems and see the ones that are falling a little bit behind and as a group, uh, concentrate on those and again with the leaderships in the school and that culture that it's all about the kids and then that also then goes back to making sure the funds are coming out of the, the central office and down into the schools where they can be used for that exact thing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scarpellini, uh, where do you see the greatest hope for the future of public education in Louisville? I see it right now. The kids sitting at the kitchen table doing their homework, hopefully with parental involvement. I uh, see it in uh, the classrooms every day where teachers work with kids at their level. I don't see it from the federal government and increased federal funding. It's just not in the cards. Uh, you know, and also see the senior as our local schools uh, working with a shared curriculum with daycare has been tried in other um, you know, districts. But getting the kids up to snuff early uh, kindergartens that um, are both fun and educational. Uh, there's a lot of great kindergarten classes here. My wife got 22 years, um, and she used to talk about some of the neat things. She wanted to go back to kindergarten. So um, it's taking what we have and doing better with it. Um, and definitely neighborhood schools work into there. The idea that any kindergartner has to ride 40 minutes on a bus is insane. I'll admit that straight out. No you know, kindergartner should have a large bus ride. But uh, make sure that the system works, that we challenge kids. I think just the idea of challenge, period, pushing them along to grow, is, is basically education is best. Classically, you know, changing behavior. So I think, you know, we can do it. We're going to have to do it. I think it's to be done locally, and it has to be emphasized. Thank you. Ms. Schultz, where do you see the greatest hope for the future of public education in Louisville? I think the greatest hope after 40 years here, with the school system being so dismal and the student academic level so bad, is the incredible community outrage right now of what is going on in our city. And it also is establishing a sense of, of urgency here. The fact that we had an audit with Adam Eland and have found 45 findings of incompetence, we are going to get that part totally corrected, hopefully, by, by having an external audit and reorganizing the financial department. And we do have to start with early childhood education, but you have to start before kindergarten. You have to start in the preschools. And you have to have the teachers engage the parents again in how to prepare their child to be kindergarten ready. I really do believe the community is pushing the school system to make changes. 40 years of this, nobody has really pushed it. We were in chaos. 
Now the community's had it. And I think this year and the, the uh, election that this school board is gonna be the beginning of a really good school system and people are gonna sit at the table and they're gonna have hard talks. We don't need cheerleaders for school board people anymore. We need people that are gonna tell the facts exactly the way they are and everybody in the community can get behind it and help get the school system right it. Thank you very much. Mr. Bailey, uh, where do you see the greatest hope for the future of public education in Louisville? The greatest hope for public education in the city of Louisville goes back to, as many of the folks here have said, to involvement. Parent, teacher, administrator, student involvement. I wholeheartedly agree that we need to get with our children early and get them started. But we need to get them started in a way that gets them excited about school, about learning. 40 minutes on the bus in the morning at 6.15 is not going to get them excited. I challenge anybody here to go ride the TARC bus for 40 minutes twice a day for a week and see how bored you are and how much you hate getting up in the morning and getting on that bus. We need to build a strong foundation. Any building is only as good as its foundation, and if we don't start with those kids early and get them excited and get their parents excited about education and learning and what it can do for them, we fail. By the time they get to high school, it's too late. They are too set in their ways. They are not ready to learn. They don't care. They've taken an attitude of, when am I out of here? The goal should be start early, catch them early. Get them excited. Get the parents excited. Put a good teacher in every classroom. My mother went in for heart surgery and we saw the nurse doing something. And we asked her a couple days later, what was all that? And she said, that was a fourth grade student of mine from 40 years ago. And she remembered a mnemonic device that I taught her. A great teacher influences kids for the rest of their lives. Catch them early. Give them a good start they'll succeed. Thank you so much, and we'll move into closing statements. We'll start with Ms. Moore in two minutes, just like before. <coughs> She'll let you know in a minute and a half uh, when to wrap up. All right, I wanna thank the PTA and, uh, for having this forum. This is very important. Uh, this is an important election. Um, there is a lot of change that needs to happen. The community, I think, realizes it. I think the reason for this forum is for you guys to to kind of get to know what we would bring to the table. So I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna give you three things because people like three things. Um, number one, I'm a parent uh, of public, with public school children. Um, 14 years experience, I think that voice is very important to have on the board. Uh, the second thing is I have the deep financial background that I think is critically needed on the board at this time. There's been a lot of talk today about budgets and audits and making sure the resources are spent as effectively as possible. I've been doing that for 25 years on a daily basis, that data-driven decision-making on a daily basis. I know what that looks like. I'm used to holding management accountable. I'm used to asking the hard questions, and I understand the numbers enough to ask the right, the correct questions, because it's not always just about spending the amount that's been budgeted. It's about spending it as wisely as possible. And then number three, uh, I am blessed right now with the time and the energy and the desire to do this. I am newly retired. I am a newly uh, empty nester. And um, I would be very excited to do this work. It's important work, and I'm ready for the challenge. Thank you. Mr. Scarpellini. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and the quality of the questions, too. Um, basically, I think boil this down to three things. We're really not look at each other's notes. But uh, <laughs> listen, lead, and manage. That's the system where if you're going to lead, you first have to know what's going on in your organization. You can't come to the board meeting and sort of scratch each other's back and say, you know, I went here, there, and everywhere. See, I think that you're going to listen to the people outside. Uh, maybe even a lot of people to talk first. At first I wasn't for that. Maybe that makes some sense. Then you have to lead. Quality leadership. Share your vision. Be willing to take the critique of your vision. And definitely manage. Manage to a system where the assistant superintendents are accountable 
to the superintendent and the board. I had the skill sets, just recently retired as, a, as an academic chairman, um, have a devotion to education. I can see how just a two or four year degree helped our kids at BU. Um, number of firefighters, fire chiefs we got, and they would never ever, unless they had that opportunity. Don't, the opportunity cost, they worked hard, and definitely a, a dedication to quality teaching. A few meetings I've been to board, I really didn't hear much on quality <coughs> teaching. Uh, I spent 15 years evaluating <coughs> faculty. So I have an idea of what is quality education. I'll work hard or constantly and hopefully do a good job. Thank you so much. Ms. Schultz, closing statements. First of all, I'm not retired. Secondly, I'm never going to retire. I have a real estate company with 45 agents. I go to work every day and love it. I sell real estate. I sell real estate to families that transfer into Louisville. I'm in the trenches every day with these families. I see how hard it is for them to pick a school. It used to be the best, the biggest stress of a relocating family was to buy a house, but not in, not in Louisville. The biggest stress is to find a school. And for all of you who don't know, if you don't come into this community during an enrollment period, you come in during half the time or whatever, and you will not be able to find where your child is going to attend school until you have a signed lease or a signed accept a contract. With that kind of an introduction to Louisville, they tell me I'm not living here, and I sell Southern Indiana, I sell Shelby County, I sell Oldham, Oldham County, uh, Bulla County, and they, those counties are growing 20%. Louisville is stagnant. That is huge. The other reason is that we have a $1.4 billion budget. Again, I've already said this. It's double what Metro <coughs> Louisville has. Why in the world are we not able to have our students achieve good academic levels? I also feel it's a basic right for every citizen of America to be given the option of an excellent public school education, and we cannot give them that in Louisville, Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come out here tonight and <coughs> express my opinion on things. Everybody in this room should be outraged. Outraged. At the article that was in the Courier Journal within the last 10 days that told us that 40% of our students who graduate are not college or career ready. I don't know about anybody else, but if I performed at a 60% level at my job, I would be out the door. It's time for a change. We got excited. We are the 51st percentile in Kentucky. We are average in the state of Kentucky, who's in the bottom quarter of the United States in education. That is not anything to be excited about. We should be leading the way, not being happy with being average in a low-rated state. Passion. I've got it. That's a requirement. The ability to understand what's going on. I've spent my life reviewing financial statements of companies from Walmart to mom-and-pop grocery stores when I'm making mortgage loans and business development loans. I understand the paperwork. I understand what questions need to be asked, how things are hidden sometimes, misstated improperly sometimes. I firmly believe in neighborhood schools. My mother used to have a poster on the wall and it was Charlie Brown with his head on his desk and it said, it's never too late to learn, but it's often too early. When I see those kids on the bus at six o'clock in the morning, it's too early. They should not be up that early going across county to get an inferior education with the budget we've got. Thank you. Thank you, and Ms. Horn. Thank you to the PTA for hosting us this evening. Um, JCPS is America's 28th largest school system with over 100,000 students. Our teachers, they are tackling some of the toughest educational challenges in the nation. 
Did you know that the number three language spoken in JCPS is May May? Just think about that. 107 languages. Our teachers are dealing with huge issues. Our children need to be the center of our universe and all of the board's decisions. That means focusing on the whole child, getting our community resources focused on our children. Together, we can do this. We can have more entering kindergarten ready to learn, more graduating on time and ready for college, more entering college and completing it. We can transform our community only through our public schools. I would like to be part of the solution. So if you elect me, I will do that. I will hold our superintendent accountable and I will do it relentlessly. I'm a PTA mom. I've got kids in school and I care deeply. Well, thank you so much. That is our time. And please help me in uh, thanking the candidates up here. Appreciate your time. I'm sorry, I couldn't get more questions. Thanks for being here. Thank you guys for coming out this evening. We appreciate your time. We unfortunately did not get through all of your questions you uh, submitted. So if you do want to talk to the candidates before they do leave, uh, I do encourage you to do that. Thank you. <coughs>